Put up your Duke Street Fighters. It's time to ask the question. What happened? I know. I know. Aliens. Colonial Marines. I, I set it up. A lot of you requested it, but since the potential, not to be overdramatic, end of Gearbox software could very well come to pass in the next few weeks or months, maybe we should just see how that story unfolds first, yeah? Believe me, I have my earballs peeled on that one. So, in the meantime, let's dump on an obscure fighting game that doesn't really deserve it, shall we? Yes! To be the realist of reals though, I've wanted to talk about Street Fighter, the movie, the game, ever since the inception of what happened, because it's a story that absolutely fascinates every corner of my mind palace. Is is just so stupid, so ill-advised, so transparent of a cash grab that even in the naive 90s, the most ardent of Capcom fans were like, "Are you serious? This this is the thing. You're 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 selling this." Oh, uh, oh, okay then. But to properly unravel the tapestry of Jean Claude Van Damme, incredible technologies and oodles and oodles of blue screen, we have to go back to the beginning, and that starts with a soft, pillowy year that was 1994. Capcom was a dominating force in the arcade scene at the time, with an avalanche of fighting games, beat-em-ups, and more fighting games, and were positively beaming with large phallic energy. They were especially bolstered by the phenomenon that was Street Fighter, and decided to shop the IP around Hollywood to see if there were any takers. This group of Capcom bigwigs, headed up by Kenzo Sujimoto, came out of every movie studio meeting they had, pretty disappointed as none of the pitches sounded right. Film studios either had no idea what the hell Street Fighter was, or were at least aware of the franchise's importance, but had no solid ideas. Universal Studios was set to be the last of Capcom's meetings, and American movie producer Ed Pressman knew he had to impress the Capcom crew before they headed back to far off exotic Nippon, where they could apparently never be contacted again. He turned to Steven E. D'Souza, a writer on various films like Die Hard and Commando, and asked if he could throw together a rough script for the film that same night, and have it ready for the morning. D'Souza agreed, but only on the caveat that he could direct as well, which would net him a bigger payday. Man, look at this fucking guy. You get that cheddar, son. Is this a joke? This money isn't worth the paper it's printed on. He set to work on the script, hastily writing throughout the night, which in turn, urged the wheel of fate to start turning. Capcom, as everyone knows, hated the pitch and immediately took the next flight back to Japan. No! <laughs> Against all odds, they actually loved D'Souza's idea of turning the Street Fighter universe into a flagrant G.I. Joe knockoff, as it would easily lend itself to action figures and merchandise, which it did. The movie, however, had to be out by the end of that year, so production was a frantic, rushed affair. There were cheesy one-liners, bison dollars, completely rewritten character backstories. It just made you want to change the channel. Now, and this was important, Capcom was funding half the production themselves and thought that they might as well kill two birdies with one stony and squeeze a game out at the same time, why not? We have actors dressed up, right? They're already working for us, right? Mortal Kombat is getting uncomfortably more popular every day, right? So let's just digitize these assholes and show these punk kids, Eddie Boon Boon and Johnny Tubbs, what we're made of. Oh, wait, we have no idea how to digitize actors, transfer all that data and make a game out of it, huh? Oh, well, who does? Incredible technologies! Now, let's, let's back up just a bit. Incredible Technologies had been around the arcade scene for a few years, as some of you may remember the unmemorable Time Killers, which was their first fighting game. They released a few coin ops under the label of Strata Games, and at an arcade trade show in early 1994, they're exhibiting said Killers of Time to a crowded audience. Capcom, who had a booth nearby, noticed this and came to see what all the hubbub was about. Time Killers was not known for its in-depth gameplay or 
much else, but it did have a striking and colorful visual style and it impressed from a technical standpoint. See, Capcom had been testing the waters on how to digitize game graphics, as they felt it was a flashy look that was taking North American arcades by storm. However, rather than waste their own time and resources trying to suss out the details themselves, once they saw what Incredible Technologies was doing with their arcade hardware, they figured, why not have these guys take a crack at it? So, a deal was signed and Incredible Technologies would start working on Street Fighter 3. I didn't stutter. Yes, the original plan was for Capcom to allow an unproven American company to develop what was, at that time, the most anticipated video game sequel ever. So, what uh, happened? I'll mention this now. Almost all of the information here was gleaned from the legendary SRK thread posted by one Alan Noon, one of the lead designers at Incredible Technologies who had a big hand in developing Street Fighter, the movie, the game. If you want a bit more in-depth insight into the project, well, just check the description below. Pressing forward, Alan maintained that yes, in those early talks with Capcom, it was being thrown around that the game would be called Street Fighter 3, featuring lots of new characters, combos, and of course Shen Long shut up. No, I'm I'm being serious, and yes, more on that later. These early talks were just that early, and a lot of the team at Incredible Technologies seemed to be confused about what form the game would ultimately take. This, however, was made clear when Capcom asked them to fly down to Australia where the Street Fighter movie was being filmed. They would capture all the actors performing the various moves and stunts, and then fly back to Chicago with all the data and get to work. That's, you know, quite a long haul just to dress people up and film them. Why not just hire local lookalikes in studio and get the work done that way? Well, Capcom had such faith that the movie was going to bust all the blocks they're joking. That they needed to have all these Hollywood stars shine. Thespians like Damien Chapa, Grand L. Bush, and Kenya Sawada. However, remember when I said that the shooting schedule for the movie was a rushed, hectic affair since they needed to fart it out before December of that year? Well, that carried over to the game as well. The team at IT were promised to get around six to eight hours of filming time with each actor, so they could be sure to get all the data they needed to avoid future reshoots. However, Jean-Claude Van Damme only showed up for about four hours and then just left. I guess because he's Jean-Claude Van Damme and there were unsnorted lines of coke somewhere on set. And who wants to go with me? Mr. Noon described working with certain actors as Ming-Na Wen, who played Chun-Li, and Peter Tuiyasosopo as Honda absolute pleasures to work with, while some other actors were less so. And there wasn't anyone more less so than Greg Rainwater, the actor hired to play T-Hawk. Wonder why T-Hawk wasn't a selectable character in either the arcade or home versions? Well, here's why. On his scheduled day of shooting for Incredible Technologies, Mr. Rainwater had rapped on the movie, so when they realized he was running late for his session, they knocked on his trailer. It had been completely cleared out. Far in the distance, an airplane could be heard sailing off into the sky. As for the other performers that actually showed up, well, several of them could not even come close to pronouncing the iconic special move names fighting game fans could recite in their sleep. IT staff had an arcade machine in the studio, performed the special moves over and over, they had the names written phonetically, and they even had Capcom employees on hand to coach the actors. No matter what they tried, it was worse than what we got. And of course, what we got was... Hurricane! Shuriken! Dragon! Ah, I love it. Some of the recording sessions also took longer than others, as most of the actors had never even thrown a punch or a kick in a movie before. Again, since the production of the film was slapped together so quickly, the on-set trainer, Benny the Jet Urquidez, had only a few weeks to teach all the actors something before cameras rolled. This is the opposite of Mortal Kombat's casting process because all those performers had years of experience in various disciplines which led to smooth filming. 
This is partially responsible why some moves and animations in Street Fighter looked so bad. But the bad didn't stop there. Since Incredible Technologies were so busy on set, they had no time to check out what was new in arcades, especially in far off Australia. So when Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo hit the scene, they had heard whispers of a legendary warrior named Akuma, and they wanted him in their game real bad. Capcom couldn't provide much material for the character, so IT had to make their own interpretation of him and ask the costuming department of the film to whip up something. And I present to you something. They didn't have a lot of time left to film, so they asked a stuntman who had a martial arts background if they would be interested in helping out. Since the recording sessions up to that point were taking forever, someone with more formal training would make the most of the filming schedule they had left. Now, since not a lot was known about Akuma at that point, a lot of his moves and animations are sort of just... Yeah... Oh, there's more. We need a new character too. Who can we get? Uh, uh, we're running out of time. Oh, th they got lots of spare bison troopers, suits, and wardrobe. Let's let's throw them in there. What's his name? Uh, knife man, bazooka dude, uh, the blade. Yeah, yeah, blade. Um, we have no one who can play them though. Alan, get your ass in that suit. Yes, Alan Noon also played the blade. Some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate up here. Now, one of the crazier things about the movie that bled into the game's development is that one of Capcom's mandates for the film's script, remember, they were co-financing it, was that every single Street Fighter character from the cast of the new Challengers had to be included in the story. But what about Fei Long? Well, to be blunt, he was just straight out cut. To be accurate though, he was in earlier drafts of the script and was working with Guile and Kami in the AN forces. Suddenly though, Capcom just started to push actor Kenya Sawada real hard, and he eventually just replaced Fei Long. In the mid-90s, Capcom was looking to have this guy as their own Sagata Senshiro style mascot, but that failed when they saw him act. A single boat against everything he's got? The pilot would have to be out of his mind. Man, this guy is just bubbling with charisma, isn't he? That being said, Incredible Technologies had two recording sessions with him. One as Sawada and the other in full Fei Long garb and even performed all his moves for video capture. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, they had to drop one of the characters and due to Capcom's insistence on pushing the Sawada agenda, Fei Long was dropped. Oddly enough though, he does make a sneaky appearance in a Mortal Kombat inspired arena for uh, some reason. Now, the elephant in the room, Shen Long. This was a character inclusion Incredible Technologies was pushing for on day one, but Capcom had always refused. You've lost your balls. Halfway into filming, however, word came down. Shen Long is a go. Remember, when this character appears, it must be like God is coming down. Alan Noon was in charge of this character, so he found an actor, dressed him up in green and black training outfit, gave him a beard, and wrapped a headband over his eyes. You see, uh, Akuma had punched his eyeballs out in a previous encounter, but Shen Long was so OP, he didn't need them. I guess you didn't see that, did you? Also, he had a big scaly horn dragon arm. Now, the idea here was, if Ryu and Ken could use the key of a dragon to shoot energy out from their hands or light their own fists on fire, Shen Long had gone so far beyond that he was literally morphing into a dragon. He would also have no blocking animations. Yeah, you could hold back to block, but he would simply weave out of the way of every attack, Matrix style. Under the hot studio lights, the dragon arm makeup would start to melt after a while, but some of his moves did get filmed. Sadly, they were not finalized in time for the game's launch and the character was cut. There's not even a surviving photo of the costume, which is a real shame because it sounds hilarious. Now with all that, the development of Street Fighter the movie, the game, was much like the film itself, a chaotic whirlwind due to the accelerated production schedule. 
there was the obvious excitement of a young team getting to work on it, wanting to impress Capcom, trying to implement lots of new elements and gameplay, but all these factors wound up resulting in feature creep. See, since they spent so much time up front filming the actors and didn't have access to their actual workstations back in the US, they had very little time to plan out the game beforehand. Therefore, once they returned to their studio in Chicago, a lot of stuff was just crammed into the game without the proper amount of thought, or testing, or thought. What also didn't help matters was the fact that when the movie released that December, it was met with commercial and critical failure. This didn't do much to boost the morale of the team who were left stuck making an adaptation of it. SFT MTG actually hit arcades a full six months after the film in June of 1995, which was probably the worst June it could have released in. The day Street Fighter the movie the game released was the most important day of your life, but for me, it was Tuesday. Mortal Kombat 3, Virtua Fighter 2, and even Street Fighter Alpha Warrior's Dreams had all been unleashed in and around that time as well, so who the hell would pump quarters into this when you could just be playing this? Aside from just the visuals and the stigma of being attached to such a stinky movie, the game was also really hard to take seriously from a gameplay perspective. Insanely overpowered characters and combos that permitted nonsensical juggling, secret bullshit moves like Guile's handcuffs, Cammy's whips, Sagat's eye lasers, or Balrog's projectile reflection all made Street Fighter veterans vomit in rage. Compared to what was coming out, it was seen as an absolute joke and was considered the first real misstep with the franchise. Capcom, sensing either the displeasure of fans or after playing it themselves, decided maybe something could be salvaged from this disaster. Enter the home versions. Handled internally by Capcom's California-based office, this might as well be considered a completely new game. It was originally going to be released on the PSX, the Saturn, and the 32X as well, until someone actually looked at a 32X and quietly cancelled it. The biggest difference was that DJ and Blanca were added to the roster, as the actors had their sessions recorded, but the data was not cleaned up for the coin-op version in time, so Capcom just decided to simply draw over the missing frames themselves. This same treatment happened to just about every other character in the game. The actor's awkward stances and moves were edited to more closely reflect the hand-drawn sprites from older Street Fighter titles. The voices were completely redone and re-recorded. All new backgrounds were added, super moves changed, all the crazy bullshit and juggling was just cut out. It was a complete page one rewrite, with the only connecting fiber being that it used digitized graphics. Well, kinda. Although, sadly, no Shen or Fei Long in sight. While this version was made exclusively to try and right the wrongs of the arcade version, it really did no such thing, as it was again critically lambasted by game magazines and the like. Although, one positive was the subtitle of the Japanese version, Street Fighter Real Battle on Film, which is a money name. Regardless, a question needed to be posed on fighting game fans. Why would you play this if you could just get Super Turbo on the 3DO or simply wait for home ports of Alpha? Why would you want to buy it at all when the movie at the time was so reviled? Again, there were a lot of factors here that simply made the current market pretty hostile, thus limiting the chances of Street Fighter the movie The Game to stand out. The fact that Capcom went with digitized actors was such a flagrant attempt to grab some of Mortal Kombat's limelight did it no real favors. It's very narrow-minded tunnel vision. Ah, that game looks like this, that's why it's popular! Digitized actors were only part of MK's appeal. The technique had been seen before in other midway titles like Pit Fighter or Warriors from the Hood, so it wasn't just that. What Capcom failed to realize was that the unique martial arts meets fantasy inspired story, the characters, the violence, and the different style of gameplay made for a mix that simply dressing up a bunch of weirdos in front of a camera impossible to replicate. This is what made Street Fighter Real Battle on Film get relegated to the dustbin of history so, so quickly and remains one of the 
only games in the franchise history to never see some sort of re-release. As for Capcom themselves, their fighting games are existing, cer certainly. Um, you know, there, there's been some missteps, but but yeah, you, the, hey, look over here! Resident Evil 2 Remake! Whoa! Uh, but it's not all bad news for Capcom in regards to this particularly dark part of their hilarious past. Let's discuss Street Fighter, the actual movie, one last time. Now, upon its release, it was considered a massive failure, but it actually turned out to be really lucrative for Capcom in the long run, since they co-financed the film. They wound up getting quite a good deal in terms of video sales and rentals, and even better when it came to broadcast rights. When I was invited to their pre-E3 Captivate event back in 2011, a senior Capcom official told me, Yeah, yeah, the movie sucks, huh? It was a huge mistake? We make a million dollars every time it's shown on TV. You got paid? Of course! As for Incredible Technologies, well, sadly, they closed their doors shortly after Street Fighter. Wait, no, they're still in business! Turns out, they were also responsible for the popular Golden Tee series and were making new entries for it up until the late aughts, and currently design home software and casino machines, so good on them. Oh right, Alan Noon? Blade himself? He was briefly at Epic Games on Shadow Complex Remastered and is currently working for, um, Magic Leap? A VR company, I think? Not entirely sure. Now, despite this being one of those rare cases where all the companies came out the other end intact and are all still in business, it doesn't change the fact this is a bittersweet story. In his forum posts, Alan Noon states he was a massive Street Fighter fan at the time, I mean, who wasn't in the 90s, and it was a dream come true to work on the franchise. However, due to the time constraints, working with new technology, and an aggressive production schedule, he laments they just weren't able to make the game they wanted to. Incredible Technologies had hope this would be their big break, and set out to make the best game they could, but unfortunately, it just couldn't come together in the end. But personally, I think any piece of media that can give us can't be all bad. If you'd like us to shine our judgmental light on another steaming pile of video game bile, drop a hint in the comments below or send a concerned and strong worded email to mattmuscles at gmail.com. Thanks for watching, everybody. Yeah!